All right, this is lesson 20 of Algebra 2 on page 98. We're going to talk about radicals. All right, so let's talk about them first. If I have the square root of 5 times the square root of 2, how do I solve that? Tress. I multiply under the radical. Now, what if I have 2 square root of 5 times 3 square root of 2? How do I solve that, Michael? Yes, Jaden? That's right. I multiply outside the radical. 2 times 3 is 6. I multiply under the radical square root 10. All right, now what if I have 2 square root of 5 times 3 square root of 2 times square root of 2? All of these terms are multiplied. I still multiply outside the radical. It's 2 times 3 times 1, which is 6. The commutative property of multiplication says it doesn't matter what order I multiply in, as long as every term is multiplied. I could then multiply square root of 2 times square root of 2. What is square root of 2 times square root of 2? Any, any square root times itself is what's under the root. Got it? So if I had the square root of x squared y times the square root of x squared y, that equals what? X squared y. X squared y. Okay. So this is going to equal 2 times 2, and then I have square root of 5. So that's 12 square root of 5. But I need to simplify. What if I had um, 2 square root of 100 times 3 square root of 20? When I look at these larger values under the radical, the first thing I'm going to do is simplify what's under the radical. And the question that I ask myself is this, are there any perfect squares that are factors of what's under the radical? Okay, so what are our perfect squares? What's the first perfect square? One. Good job. What's the second one? Four. Four. You understand what a perfect square is? The next one is? Nine. Nine. The next one? Sixteen. Okay, so that's what I'm asking myself. Does one, four, sixteen, twenty-five, thirty-six, is there a perfect square in a hundred? What is it? What? Ten is not? Well, ten is a perfect square. 10 is a perfect square of 100. But think of another perfect square that goes into 100. Two. Two is not a perfect square. Four goes into 100. I can rewrite 100, even though we know the square root of 100 is 10. It's 4 times 25, right? Both of those are perfect squares. So that really can be written 2 times the square root of 4 times the square root of 25. You see how we can rewrite these radicals? Times 3. Is there a perfect square that goes into 20? Which one? What would you say? 4. So I can rewrite this as 3 times the square root of 4 times 5, which would be the same thing as 3 times the square root of 4, times the square root of 5. You following me so far? All right, so I can unsquare the 4 and the 25. That would be 2 times 2 times 5 times 3. Can I unsquare the 4? Times 4 times the square root of 5. All right, so... The first three, what's the value of the first three? It's two times, yes. Two, two, yes. Thank you, Nora. 
two. What, what's the product of the first three? What is it? 20. 20. All right, and the product of the next two? Six. 20 times six is? 120 square to five. All right, so now let's work an example. What are we going to do before we add or subtract? We are going to simplify the radical if it can. How do we simplify the radical? What question do we ask ourselves? Say it. Say it louder, Will. Are there any perfect squares that are factors of the value under the radical? All right, so look at example 20.1. It's 3 times the square root of 50 minus 5 times the square root of 200. All right, is there a perfect square that goes into 50? What, which one? 25. So I can see this as 3 times the square root of 25 times 2, right? Can I unsquare 25? Yes. This is 3 times 5 times the square root of 2. And multiplying my 3 times 5, that's 15 square root of 2. From that, I thought 5 would be under a square root. The square root of 25 is 5. We unsquared, we left the 2 under, right? I know I had to go back and make sure I did it right. Okay, is there a perfect square that goes into 200? 25 does. Is there a larger one? 100, right? Okay, I know I messed you up by working the 100 one last time, 25 times 4. But 100 goes in to 200, and it is a perfect square. So 100 times 2 under that radical is the 200. Can I unsquare the 100? What does it become? So this is 5 times 10 times the square root of 2. Multiplying my 5 times 10, I have 50 times the square root of 2. When I have terms that have the exact same radical, see both of them are square root of 2, then these are called like radicals. And in the same way, when I have 5x squared minus 10x squared, these are like terms, how do I add these or subtract them? I add or subtract the coefficients. It would be 5 minus 10. Does the x squared change? No. So this is negative 5x squared. We're going to treat radicals the same way. When we have radicals that are like, we're going to see what's multiplied by them, treat them as coefficients, and leave the radical the same. So we do 15 minus 50, and what is that? Negative 35. Negative 35 square root of 2 remains. They're called like radicals. All right, look at example two. Example two is three square root of two times four Square root of 12 times 2 square root of 3. First thing I ask myself is, are there any perfect squares that go into any of these radicals? The first one is a prime term. It's just, and all of these terms are multiplied. So now I'm just going to put multiplication signs between every term. 3 times the square root of 2 times 4 what about 12? Is there a perfect square that goes into 12? 4. So this is really 
times the square root of four times three, right? Times two times square root of three. I'm not gonna multiply under the radicals yet. I'm going to resolve this one in the middle first. So this is three times square root of two times four. I can unsquare the four, it becomes two times square root of three times two times square root of three. I anticipated this. When I have two like radicals multiplied, square root of three times square root of three, what is that? It's three. So I am going to make this three. Those two will become three. All right, so we have three times square root of two. I'm gonna go ahead and multiply four times two is eight. Square root of three times square root of three is three times two. Okay, do I want to multiply? I wanna multiply. Guys, this is the commutative property of multiplication. It says it doesn't matter what order I multiply in, I get the same result. What's two times three? Okay. What's three times two? Okay. Same, right? That's the commutative property of multiplication. All right, so I know I'm gonna end up with a square root of two. It's the only radical. So I think I wanna multiply three times three, which is nine, nine times eight. 72 times 2, 144. Okay, you see how I chose wisely on how to multiply? <clears throat> All right, we're going to do one more example. And it is a little different as well. In this example, we have, on the top of page 99, <clears throat> we have parentheses. So we must distribute the term on the outside to eliminate the parentheses. So it's 4 square root of 3, open parentheses, 2 square root of 3 minus square root of 6. All right, so we have to distribute. When I distribute, I multiply outside the radical, I multiply under the radical. So four times two is eight times, what's the square root of three times the square root of three? It's three, you guys are getting good at this. Minus, and I distribute it to the other term, it's just four times one. Under the radical, I'm just gonna say it's three times six, because I know that there's a three and six. Did you know that? Six is three times two. All right, so this is 24 minus four times the square root of three times three times two. I just wrote the factors of six. Yes. Wait, so I'm confused on how you can put the like, square root of three times six. Oh, square root of three times the square root of six is just three times six under oh, the radical. Okay, thank you. No, that's okay. Then I made the six three times two because now I see there's two threes under the radical. Okay, this only works when it's square root. When it's cube root, I need three of them to equal what's under the cube root. If it's a fourth root, how many do I need? Fifth root? and so forth. Make sense? The only reason I need two is because this is a square root. All right, so I pull that out, it becomes a three. So it's 24 minus four times three times the square root of two. Our 24 minus 12 square root of two. This is the proper form for this solution. We do rational numbers first. Rational numbers go first. Then it's plus or minus irrational numbers. 
I would never write negative 12 square root of two plus 24. That is not the proper form. We're gonna add another form later and it's gonna be plus or minus and it's gonna be a complex number and that complex number, there's one of them, is I. Okay? Proper form matters. So rational first, irrational next, and then we're gonna add later on in the course um, the uh, complex. All right, the second part of this lesson, I'm gonna go ahead and teach, and it talks about parallel lines and equations of parallel lines. All right, let's look at this. We looked at lots of parallel lines. Let's see some conclusions that we can draw from parallel lines. What are some conclusions that we know are true about parallel lines? Yes. What's equal about them? There is something equal. What is it? The distance between them is equal, right? The distance between them never changes. Were you going to say something else, Will? The, they have the same slope. It doesn't change. Same slope. What is different? Yes. The y-intercept is different. Um, if I use substitution or elimination, would I come up with an x value and a y value? Solution. No, because do they have any solutions in common? Not one. Not one x, y value on this line is the same as one on this line. So when we've been using substitution and elimination, what have we been solving for? That point of concurrency of those lines. Parallel lines are inconsistent. We're going to go over this in a later lesson. All right, so same slope, different y-intercept. All right, look at 20.4. And remember, we have all of these forms. We have ax plus by equals c. What's that form called? Yes, standard. standard. What is this form called? That is slope intercept. And we have a new one. What is that called? Point slope, that's right. Okay, look at 20.4. It says find the equation of a line that is parallel. So it's gonna be parallel to 2y minus x equals 2, and it has this point on its line. All right, since parallel lines have the exact same slope, I take the line that it's parallel to, I put it in slope-intercept form so that I see what the slope of this line is that it's parallel to. Because once I have the slope of a line parallel to it, to find the equation of this line, I simply plug that slope in, plug those points in, and come up with the, the equation. First, first, I'm going to find the slope. So I'll, I'm gonna take that equation, two y minus x equals two. I'll add the x on both sides. I'm left with 2y equals x plus 2. Notice I did not write 2 plus x because I want it in this form. I divide every term by 2. I have y equals 1 half x plus 1. This is the information I need from this line. Because what do parallel lines have? Same slope, but my y-intercept is going to be different. If it's not, then it's the same line. All right, so I take this slope 
and that point, and I plug it in to the point slope form to get my equation. So it's y minus negative one is positive one is equals the slope times x minus that x coordinate. All right, so we have, I'll sub, we'll distribute the one half first. That's what we'll do first. Y plus one is one half X minus three halves. I'm gonna subtract one, but I'm gonna subtract it as two over two. So that when I move it to the other side, we have a common denominator. So I'll subtract two over two on both sides. And we have Y equals one half X Negative two over two, negative three over two minus two over two is negative five, two. five halves. That is the equation of the line that's parallel. Yes. So the third, what's it called again? The third part. This is called the point slope. So that is specifically for parallel lines? No. It's for any line that I need the equation for that I have a point on the line and I have a slope. Got it? If they give me the slope and the y-intercept, I'm gonna use this one. If, if I can come up with the slope and have a point, I'm using this third form. But couldn't you use the uh, y-intercept, I mean, uh, slope-intercept form to find the point of the line? You could, then you'd have to solve for the B value <clears throat> and go back and plug it in. If I use this form, look what I end up with. I don't have to go plug anything back in. 